I'm going to take you back a few years to your maths classroom, which I hope didn't look something like this. And I'm going to ask you a maths question, and then I'm going to get one of you to stand up and tell us all the answer. So, what is 17 times 24? Now, I'm not actually going to get one of you to stand up, because that would be horrible. And I've put the answer up here uh, on the board, because to stop those of you who like this kind of thing from being unable to hear me until you've worked it out. But for most of you, the majority, I suspect, to stop that uncomfortable feeling that it's maybe something like this, or this, or this, or this. Everyone has a physiological response to a question such as 17 times 24. Your heart rate elevates, your pupils dilate, it's part of your so-called fight-or-flight mechanism, which by its nature is uncomfortable. It's great for the original purpose of preparing you to r run away from a lion or to fight the tribe coming over the next hill, but it's not so great for mental arithmetic. So the easiest response for many is to fold your arms and say, I can't do maths, especially when others seem to always get the answer before you. And there are some real problems with the way we conceive of maths here in the UK. In school, it's often a very starkly binary approach with all the focus on the answer rather than the process. And when you're going through the process, the question either seems impossible because you haven't worked it out yet, or easy because you just have. Which brings to mind Nelson Mandela's quote that everything seems impossible until it's done. Nowhere is this more glaring than in maths. And inevitably, for the majority of children, there'll always be other kids who seem to get the answer more quickly and easily than they do, while they're still stuck at the impossible stage. And our enthusiasm to categorise by ability at a young age, and then put kids into ability groups or sets, creates an unhelpful divide between those who are fast at maths at a young age, which in itself is not a great predictor of future uh, potential. Einstein, for example, was very slow, and those who aren't. So if you're slow, you get put in a bottom or a low set. And which kids is it that often end up in these sets? Well, often those who've had less parental input or less rich intellectually stimulating out-of-school or preschool experiences. In other words, nothing to do with their future potential. And we've got research to show that 85% of kids who get put in a bottom set for maths stay there throughout their school career, which is hardly a recipe for social mobility. At National Numeracy, we don't believe these children are actually bad at maths. But they start to see themselves in that way, and others categorise them as such. And so maybe it's slightly logical to kind of give up on maths and focus your efforts on other areas where you feel yourself as being good at or others, other people say that you're good at. And we think a fundamental problem with maths here in the UK, and it's also true in the US, is our enthusiasm to categorise current low attainment as some kind of quasi-genetic low ability, the maths gene myth, something that simply doesn't happen in high-performing countries. As an example, the OECD asked 15-year-olds what does it take to be successful in maths? They didn't ask the question here in the UK, but in the US, 40% of kids said it's about talent. You've either got it or you haven't. In Japan, which performs much more highly, 80% of kids said maths is about effort. You just need to stick with it. So how does this relate to later life? And does being able to calculate 17 twi times 24 rapidly really matter? I'd argue not really. It's important to know the answer is going to be about 400. But we all carry around with us a, a tool in our pocket that has more computing power than it took to get to the moon. But, and this is a big but, if the formative moments in your maths classroom mean that I can't do maths is your overwhelming emotion when you're presented with numbers and data in adult life, then it really does matter, because it's simply not possible 
to make good decisions without engaging with and potentially manipulating quantitative information. So what kind of things are we thinking about? Well, potentially mundane activities such as choosing a phone contract or planning a journey. Socially important activities such as cooking a meal for your new girlfriend or boyfriend. Boring but personal vital uh, things such as checking your pay statement or planning your future finances. And I also think it's important to be able to use numbers and data to engage effectively as a citizen in a democracy. And yes, I absolutely am thinking about £350 million on the side of a bus. But surely most people just get mass qualifications at school and that sets them up just fine. Unfortunately, that's not the case. The most recent government commission survey of adult skills used questions such as this one to assess everyday maths levels. And that's multiple choice and also uh, using a calculator. Remarkably, less than a quarter of those who had got A to C at GCSE within the last eight years were able to answer this kind of question correctly. And across the whole population, that figure is 22%. So I'm pretty sure this room is not a representative sample, but if it were, that would just be this little group down here. It's getting worse for numeracy, but getting better for literacy, and it really does matter, both for the UK and for individuals themselves. For the UK, a conservative estimate sees poor numeracy costing the economy £20.2 billion a year. And for individuals, Research from the OECD suggests that good numeracy is the best protection against unemployment, low wages and poor health, more significant than literacy or any other variable that they measure. So this is an issue for millions across the country and indeed across the world. But there is a way forward and it's not about teaching ever more complex maths in schools. Instead, there are three things that we need to enable everyone to be confident and competent to use numbers and data in daily life. The first is value. Valuing the importance not so much of the complex maths in simple situations that you're often presented with at school, but instead the value of being able to use normally rather simple maths, but to help you make good decisions in daily life. The second element is belief or mindset. And this is basically shifting from I can't do maths to I can't do maths yet. There is no maths gene. Or to put it another way, we all have the genetic makeup to become numerate. And there's a growing body of evidence from neuroscience and behavioral psychology, from the work of Carol Dweck, Angela Duckworth, Joe Bowler, Daniel Kahneman, 17 times 24 is from him, by the way and indeed our work at National Numeracy, that's starting to destroy what Matthew Saeed calls the talent myth, something particularly prevalent around maths. And the final element is effort. What does it feel like when you don't know what to do? Formative moments always start by being uncomfortable. That's mentally, but it also applies physically. We've got to struggle and get things wrong a lot in order to eventually succeed. Indeed, as Nassim Nicholas Taleb points out, acute or short-term effort and discomfort is good or probably even vital for us. And the avoidance of short-term discomfort leads to chronic or long-term discomfort. And if you buy that, it might be worth thinking about when was the last time you were outside your comfort zone. And I'm not including a few seconds, nine and a half minutes ago. So to sum up, the lesson that we need to take from the maths classroom is not, I can't do maths, but instead that discomfort is the starting point for any formative moment or opportunity for learning, and that this is at its most stark in maths. So no matter what stage of life you're at, you can reform formative moments if you need to. You can become numerous. Indeed, you can do almost anything to a decent level but only if you're prepared to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Thank you.